All right, everyone, welcome back into another PGA DFS video. Going to be breaking down a new tournament that we have here, which is going to be the Black Desert Championship, a fall series event that's going to be played at a new course in Utah called the Black Desert Golf Course. And I want to start with talking about this golf course because it looks awesome. So I've really only played like one true desert golf course in my life before. That was Greyhawk Golf Course in uh, Phoenix. They actually play a few national championships there. And this course kind of reminds me of that course a decent amount. Not really like the Waste Management Phoenix Open course that we have, which is more of a TPC style course. This is like truly a desert style course, meaning that you might need to really drive the golf ball well on this course to have success and to not really penalize yourself. Now, the biggest question when I have or what I have for this tournament is going to be how difficult are they going to make it play? I like to look at the 3M Open. The first year that they had, the first couple of years that they had, it actually played a little bit easier than what it has lately. I think that was a way to attract players to want to come back to that event. Now, I think given this course, the PGA Tour is not really going to need to do that. I think the course is already going to be the attraction. Utah is kind of a fun spot to go to and visit. I would assume some players are going to want to do that. And just some kind of fun facts about this course. Tom Weiskopf is the uh, course architect. He's designed several courses that are on the PGA Tour. The greens are going to have a stint meter of about 12, which is typically standard. It's going to be kind of a normal uh, size course around 7,370. It's par 71. The biggest hazards are going to be kind of just hitting it not in the fairway. That's the biggest defense that this course has. So again, you're going to have to hit the ball accurately. We'll see how much the ball rolls out. That's a big piece as well. Uh, everything is going to be bent, bent grass, that is. And just kind of a fun thing about this tournament is that one of the players that a lot of people are probably going to be on outright wise because of the narrative uh, if they see it. And then also like DFS wise is the fact that Patrick Fishburn, a guy that you know, has been playing extremely well, is from Utah. Um, Zach Blair is as well, but we're probably not looking at him too much. But Patrick Fishburne, that's like the little bit of narrative that I think a lot of people are going to get behind. So guys, the one thing about this course being a new course is we really won't know what to expect in terms of key stats. We can make some educated guesses. Typically speaking, I like to just look at general, more broad key stats. But this week is a week in which I do think looking at golfers that are not going to make mistakes is going to be very crucial. Looking at golfers that are going to hit the fairways as well, I do think it's going to be uh, crucial. And then ball striking and kind of just greens gained. Just golfers that are going to be hitting the ball where they want to and golfers that are going to set themselves up for birdie tries. So we're looking at birdie to bogey ratio. We're looking at good drive percentage, ball striking, and greens gained. And so the players that are popping up key stat wise, Austin Smotherman. Then you got Keith Mitchell. Keith Mitchell coming in off of a good week, kind of a heartbreaking week. Uh, Chan Kim, Peter Quest. A lot of these golfers are golfers that we might not have all the data points that we'd really want on them. Basically, we're still using the the 2024 season. So if they're not on the PGA Tour site, that's going to be it. But Good thing is that we have the strokes gain data as well for a lot of those golfers over their last five events and, and whatnot. So one thing that we could turn to with not having really a, a key stat sample size or data set that we'd really need to go in on is looking at the specialist data, which is something that I typically look at, especially when we don't have any course history to go off of as well. Uh, the thing with it is we... I think this is the first time in like 65 years that a tournament has been held in Utah. And again, we really never see any true desert style course. This is truly a unique course, which is really awesome for this week. Again, it's going to be fun to watch. This is stuff I personally think the PGA Tour needs more of. I'm really excited to watch this event. I haven't been that excited to watch a golf event in quite some time. It's really felt like a job to me. They need more of this. And so, yeah, needless to say, I'm excited. So, um, in terms of style, we rarely see like true desert style courses. Uh, we do see it on the DP tour a little bit. So like Ryan Fox has a, a little bit of course experience on desert style courses. Uh, Nicholas uh, Echeverria does as well, but we're just not going to get that many golfers that do tr truly have a desert style course uh, experience. So we jump into the golfers that had the best current form on the PGA Tour and Seamus Powers number one, Chan Kim number two, Andrew Novak number three, Rico Hoey number four, and then Patrick Fishburn number five. Again, I think Patrick Fishburn is going to be an extremely interesting player for a lot of people to be on. But uh, for me, guys, I'm probably looking at golfers that are coming in with a made cut streak. I, I do think I want to be looking at that. Um, just good form, especially in the fall swing. Uh, the, the thing about this part of the season is a lot of the golfers that we're looking at we just haven't seen them in quite some time. Uh, and so 
the less like competitive rounds that we've seen a golfer have recently, the more variance is going to enter in. And so we're going to see more varying results. I think we saw that last week. Now, some of those golfers that we saw last week are playing this week, which should lead to a little bit more predictability. But given the fact that this is a new course, it might not be as predictable as really we would all want. And so for course history, really the only thing that I'm going to be looking at this week is the Phoenix Open. At the same time, I don't really care for that. It's the closest comp course I could have. But again, I just, who cares? It's it's seems like a completely unique course, which again, gets me excited about this week. So with that, guys, let's just go ahead and look at which golfers are going to be the top plays this week. Starting out with Keith Mitchell. Keith Mitchell is going to be someone I think everyone's going to be getting to. Kind of had a typical Keith Mitchell week, letting down the betting community last week with a third place finish, a bogey on 18 to miss out on winning. But he is playing great golf. Uh, he's always been a great staff fit. Uh, typically, Ben, someone that you could argue has been a good outright bet really the whole year. And so now, now he's finally like showing up a third, a 12th, and 11th, that's all great stuff. And so I could argue that, yeah, we should probably be getting on Keith Mitchell a little bit. How will he deal with the heartbreak is going to be the biggest question. And that's a question that obviously I wouldn't have the answer to. No one's really going to have the answer to. Uh, but the the thing I don't like about him is we're only getting him at like 16 to 1 odds, really not the best odds there. Um, but he's fine. Like He's fine. Uh, has played well at the Waste Management Phoenix Open for what that's worth. You also have she uh, Seamus Power, who, as we saw, is coming in in the best form in the field. He is going to be ranking out really well in the 9-5 to five model uh, as a whole. And the nice thing about Seamus Power is we can get him at 28-1. to one. So he's someone that, betting-wise, I do think I like a decent amount. But in terms of DFS, I don't think we really need to play either of them. I do think starting out your betting card with Patrick Fishburne, to me, does make a lot of sense. You can get him at 35-1 to one on most sites. Uh, the thing with it is he's coming in with great form. Maybe he's played this course before. That's some piece of information I would like to have. Again, being a Utah guy, that, that might benefit him a lot. But at the same time, again... I'm going to keep saying this. It's a unique course. Like if he hasn't played it, I don't think him being from Utah is going to give him any advantage over other golfers. I just don't see that happening. Uh, but if he has played it, yeah, by all means, that would help. So if you guys know that, honestly, put it in the comment section. But as we touched on last week, he's just been in solid form. Besides that one missed cut where he missed it kind of the number, been playing great. 48th last week wasn't all too good. That's kind of the issue with those easy scoring events is even when you are playing well, you're not playing well enough sometimes. And I think that's just really what happened with Patrick Fishburne where easy scoring event couldn't keep the pedal or the foot on the gas. Ben Griffin's been in pretty good form. I'd be happy to get to him. Uh, but I think going with Chan Kim is a play that makes a lot of sense. Chan Kim, when we look across the board data set wise, going to be a good specialist. Great stat fit. He's a guy that's just playing extremely well. Top 10 or better in the field in birdie to bogey ratio. Good drive percentage, ball striking, greens gain. So really good there. We can typically trust those type of players. Uh, Recent form, second best in the field. So he's going to rank out really well in the 9-5 to five miles. So obviously, outright-wise, I'm going to like him 35-1. to one. But also DFS-wise, I think starting your builds out maybe in more of a fair and balanced way is going to be the way to go. And so I don't mind getting to someone like Chan Kim, who as a whole ha has been playing great. You know, he's a name that has been popping up throughout the whole 2024 season. Obviously, he's someone that needs to play well. He's going to be motivated to play well. So I'm happy to get to him. And then from there, really... Like probably one of the best plays on the board in terms of being mispriced is going to be Andrew Novak. Andrew Novak's a golfer that had an eighth place finish at the Waste Management Phoenix Open. Again, not really putting too much merit into that, but desert style course kind of. So it's it's noteworthy, I would say. But really, it's, it's, it's the form that we're looking at. On the season, only five missed cuts. Love that. Has been playing well as well. Uh, you know, he's one of those golfers that last week, maybe I was a little bit worried about because we didn't see him play at the pro core championship. Well, that's fine. He ended up with a top 25 place finish. And maybe if he was shaking off the rest, that's going to be a good thing even more so for us this week, because he's going to be someone that just looks like a great, great option for us. Third best in recent form, 11th best staff in the field. The one concern would be that approach, uh, his approach game uh, compared to the field, where it ranks about 30th or so in ball striking and greens gained. He does rank out top 10, though, in birdie to bogey ratio and also good drive percentage. So at least he's going to set himself up to be able to approach greens properly. That's the key thing. And I like the odds that we're getting on him as well. If you guys want to place an outright bet on him, 41 feels pretty good there. So, and then from there, guys, you're going to see a lot of golfers that kind of seem mispriced, just how well they've been playing lately and kind of how much we, we've been able to trust them. So I really like Doug Gim as an option, but we also have Justin Lauer right there, Mac Meissner there as well. Mac's been someone that's been more of a GPP play, I will say, more GPP upside where if it gets hot, I can see him really going low. Uh, but Justin Lauer, eight straight make cuts, Doug Gim, four straight make cuts, both Lauer and Gim have played well at the Waste Management Phoenix Open again. 
don't really care too much about that, but it's noteworthy, I would say. Both of them top 20 or better in all the key metrics that we look at. So really, in simple, I'm happy to play both of them. We'll take a peek at their odds. And so we can get Doug Gim to win at 50 to 1. I, I really don't mind that. He's coming in off of a 33rd place finish at the Sanderson Farms Championship, which not all that good, but he's been consistent lately. And then he also played at the Pro Core Championship, finishing good enough. <laughs> you know, it, it, I'm kind of okay with that. And so four straight make cuts for him in a row. Overall, top 20 in the field in recent form rank. Like, I wish that was better, but at least it's it's been steady. And at least we've seen him play in the fall swing. So that should reduce the variance in his game a little bit. So we should be able to trust him a little bit more. So if he's popping up, you know, as a good play on, on paper, it's probably more true. And so I'm happy to play him, especially at that price tag of below AK on DraftKings. And then Justin Lauer as well, going to be some that I think is one of the better plays on the board, uh, 50 to one as well. All right, wise, obviously it's a week in which it's going to be more spread out in terms of who can win. We saw that last week as well with Kevin New winning, which was a little bit annoying because he was someone I was on a decent amount last year to uh, win outright. Good for him, though. He's been someone that always seemed like he could put it all together. Good for him. Justin Lauer is someone that has been playing pretty consistently. I mean, we can see based off of his form, really one or two bad starts in there where there are close missed cuts. But he's been playing well recently. He's also someone that we have seen play twice during the fall swing, which, again, I like that. I think that's huge. 28th place finish last week. Top 10 place finish at the Pro Core Championship. Again, he's someone you can get at 50 to 1. So we can go ahead and put those two into our builds and kind of feel pretty good about the build that we have going. If you wanted to go Mac as well, I wouldn't hate it, but that's not really someone I'm going out of my way to target. Uh, he's been a little bit too hit or miss for me to love, you know, in a first look build, but definitely someone you could play in a GPP build. Chandler Phillips is fine. Jacob Bridgman is fine. Bud Colley is, is decent as well. Zach Blair is a play I could probably talk myself into if we get news that he has played at this tournament before. Again, I haven't seen that, but you know, that is something I, I could definitely find merit in rico hoy as well again pretty strong form for him as a whole you look at his uh recent events he's either made the cut or missed the cut ran the number which in a field like this you would tend to believe that he would be able to make the cuts Blake taylor has played well at the waste management phoenix open so i guess worth noting uh maybe you know that'd be kind of one of those things in retrospect that we'd look at and say all right that's why he he did well one player that I was a little bit worried about last week uh, about being on uh, was Nick Hardy. Nick Hardy had been someone that had made uh, three straight cuts in a row at that time. Now he's made four straight cuts, so he's going to be even still appealing. Decent staff fit. He's just a quality play across the board, especially given the price tag. And so if we can get a make cut out of him at that cheap of a price tag, I'd be happy to do that. Another play that I would say kind of falls under that same umbrella would be Henrik Norlander, who Norlander is going to be an extremely good staff fit. Form is a little bit spotty but still ranks out top 12 in the field. So he's also someone I think I can get to. And then for what's worth, like Lanto Griffin has a value, four straight make cuts. He's decent. Carson Young's decent. Justin Suh's decent. There, there's a lot of okay values. So guys, this would probably be my ideal build as it sits right now. Obviously, we're going to be about $200 off. Not exactly sure what pivot I would want to make, honestly. Like I, I think this is a pretty solid base build. This could actually be a week in which I'm, I'm okay leaving some salary left on the board as well. Like I mentioned, Nick Hardy, I feel like he's going to be a safe play for us. Uh, Henrik Norlander, I, I think, is great. Don't know if I exactly feel the need to go out of my way to roster Bo Hosler just because he's priced that much. Like, I might just go with Patrick Fishburne, have $400 left over, and be okay with that. Now, that's all great. Let's go ahead and see what the 9 to 5 lineup builder is telling us is going to be an optimal build as well. And so, guys, to get the 9 to 5 lineup builder to start, you just have to give it two data points to go off of. So we'll just bump up Seamus Power to 121. We'll bump up Keith Mitchell to 123 for their fantasy projections. I'm just going to do kind of a dry run from there just to see what the data is telling us is currently the best projected lineup that we can be on. That's going to be Patrick Fishburne. All right. I'm okay with that. Chan Kim, Andrew Novak, Doug Gim, Justin Lauer, Pat and Kazire. I view Pat and Kazire as more of a GPP play, but I'm kind of okay with that. So the data is also on par with what I'm seeing for this week as well. So I do like that idea. I'm okay with that. All right, so just to reiterate, the players that I see as core plays, Andrew Novak to me is one of the better core plays. You can get him at about 50 to 40 to 1 on most sports weeks. I feel like that's going to be a good outright bet. Patrick Fishburne, I don't know if I exactly see him as like a core play, core play, but I do think he's going to make for a great outright bet as price is going to be easy to get to. Does have those ties again to Utah. We'll see how much that ends up mattering. Uh, Doug Gim coming in off of four straight make cuts. He is someone that we have seen twice now 
during the fall swing. Again, that should lead to a little bit more predictability. Going to be a good staff fit in the field as well. He's someone that I like getting to. Then Chan Kim also falls under that same umbrella, uh, basically as Doug Gim. Just a little bit better of a play in terms of potential upside. We have seen him hold some decent upside, especially recently. Uh, all three of those plays are going to be great plays. And then Justin Lauer as well. Justin Lauer having some of the better form in the field recently. Top 10 finish at the Pro Core Championship. And then at the Sanderson Farms Championship, eighth top 30 finish, which we'll take. Going to be a good staff fit across the board. So overall, this is a week in which I, I do like, especially compared to last week. It's a it's a fun week. It's a week I'm going to be excited for. Um, probably will be trying to come out with more golf content. Honestly, let me know in the comment section what you guys want below. Um, could come out with a, a values video, kind of a line of builder video. All right, bet video. We'll be coming out with a props bets <laughs> video for you guys as well. Uh, for underdog and prize picks. That's something I plan on doing. Uh, but let me know. Uh, it is the fall swing. Obviously, there's not as much eyes on golf. I get that. Uh, but I want to get more golf content out to you guys. So let me know what you guys want. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to give a like and subscribe. That does help out the channel a bunch. Thank you guys for being here.